welcome to the Muslim Viewpoint, a new video podcast series powered by the nonprofit national media platform American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Maya Gaylor, and today we are continuing our Get Out the Vote series. Joining us is Ben Steinhoff, who is running for election as the Democratic candidate to represent Wisconsin's 5th Congressional District against incumbent Scott Fitzgerald. Thank you for joining us. So we're just going to start by having you tell us um, just a little bit about yourself, your background, and why you have decided to run for this office. Uh, Well, my name is Ben Steinhoff, and I'm running for Wisconsin's 5th Congressional District. It encompasses uh, southeastern Wisconsin, so Waukesha, Jefferson, and uh, Washington counties then a couple bits and pieces of other counties around there. But uh, it is one of the deepest, reddest districts in in the entire country. But I decided to run um, because I saw over the last couple election cycles that we were running candidates that, you know, would be great candidates elsewhere. But in terms of the makeup of this district, it's a very blue collar, hardworking district. And so I really knew that we needed a candidate that was going to reflect those values. I'm a paramedic firefighter, uh, worked at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. So I've volunteered for my community. I've done volunteer EMS, volunteer firefighting um, for local services that, you know, were just in need for it. And during COVID, um, I was working two jobs. I was a firefighter paramedic for the city of Monona. I was also working in the emergency room and med flight at University of Wisconsin. And in my off time, so like every every couple days, um, I would carry the pager for our local EMS station in Lake Mills because they were strictly volunteer. And during COVID, not very many people wanted to volunteer for that job. And, you know, considering I was already, you know, very high risk working in the ER and med flight, I figured, you know, might as well help out my community. So I was making like $1.27 an hour to carry the pager. So like it, I didn't do it, you know, <laughs> to pay for my mortgage or anything. I literally did it because I knew that the people in the community needed a higher level of care. So I've always kind of dedicated myself to helping other people. That's why I got into emergency medicine. And I just think that we need more people like that uh, representing us in Washington instead of businessmen and career politicians that are really only focused on themselves, their re-election, and how much money they can, you know, profit off of being in office. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and as you mentioned, so your district, like you said, historically votes Republican, votes red. Wisconsin, this election cycle is a battleground state, uh, you know, in, in November for the presidential election. So can you kind of maybe just give us your predictions for the state as far as um, the presidential election goes? Uh, if you look at the state- state of Wisconsin, historically, it's, you know, usually always a battleground state. Um, It goes back and forth, you know, between Democrat and Republican every single year. And, you know, people always say, as goes Wisconsin, goes the nation. And, you know, that's kind of why, even though we only have 10 electoral votes, uh, we're all kind of uh, between Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, you know, like uh, some people refer to that area, like as the Rust Belt, because, you know, manufacturing jobs have been leaving uh, those areas in the past, you know, couple decades. We really need to revitalize you know, kind of these rural areas. So uh, for the past several presidential elections, uh, all the presidential nominees have been, you know, really hitting these states hard. And I I know that Minnesota has gone Democratic, you know, every single cycle for longer than I've been alive. But, uh, you know, they're still kind of considered a battleground state because it is, you know, usually pretty close margins there. But in terms of the state of Wisconsin, I mean, we're 50-50 every year. There's so many people this year that are going to be voting uh, because one of our U.S. senators is up for re-election, Tammy Baldwin. She's running against uh, the Republican Eric Hovde. And uh, there's a lot of people that I know and that I've spoken to personally that are going to vote for Donald Trump and Tammy Baldwin. You know, those two are on complete opposite sides of the political spectrum. But people really um, enjoy what Tammy Baldwin has done for rural communities in rural Wisconsin. But they also still want to vote for Donald Trump. So, you know, there's so many people that vote cross ticket in the state that it is, you know, makes it a little little hard to try and, you know, target who you're going to, you know, try and pick off for these uh, for these votes. But in terms of my district specifically, um, you know, like I said, it's a blue collar, hardworking district. And we just need somebody that, you know, has actually lived those values before. Uh, My opponent, Scott Fitzgerald, has been a career politician. He's been, you know, over 30 plus years in the state house, and he's now been in Congress for the last two cycles. And he really doesn't ever push forward things that help everyday Americans. 
Uh, he's funded by big banks and BlackRock investment firm. That's his number one investor. And so you kind of know where you see where people's money is coming from, where they're going to align politically. So I am 100% grassroots funded. So literally the people that have given me money are the people that I listen to about their issues, about what they care about. Whereas my opponent, Scott Fitzgerald, big banks are who he listens to. So all the legislation that he votes in favor of that he wants to pass, you know, all benefits, big banks, especially. Right. And you kind of touched on my next question. Can you just elaborate for us just a little bit more on what exactly you changes you would make if elected, you know, rather than the, the current incumbent. You know, one of the biggest things that I hear from Democrats and Republicans is that they want to get big money out of politics. And that's what Scott Fitzgerald has, you know, basically thrived on his entire career has been big money, big banks, insurance industries. And ever since Citizens United back in 2011, you know, we've seen this stratification, this extreme stratification in our political system. So we have people getting pushed further to the left, pushed further, further to the right, because all these big money interests can dump, you know, just ungodly amounts of money into the political system. So instead of having it be based on, you know, your merits and what you can do and, you know, fiscal responsibility, I'm one of the lowest raising congressional candidates that we've had in this district before. And yet we are, you know, our polling numbers are getting better and better for the elections on August 13th that we had for the primaries here in the state of Wisconsin. I got 13,000 more votes than any other Democratic nominees ever gotten before. And it's because I've been out quite literally in the streets talking to people, you know, uh, in Wisconsin, county fairs are a big thing. So that's what I did all summer long was every single day for the basically the entire summer, I was at a county fair that was in my district. And I was going out talking to people and letting them know, you know, who I am, and what, you know, what my plan is. And that's really the best way to, you know, meet the electorate quite literally is to be where they're at, you know, and so I was out talking to them, uh, got my name out there. And like I said, it really reflected for the August 13th election. So just being here in the district, listening to people and actually listening to their issues instead of, you know, listening to what the, the big money says and, you know, hey, I want you to vote this way. Whereas I can actually go out and listen to the people in my community that are struggling, that need help. Yeah. And then regarding those uh, people in your community, um, although Wisconsin has, you know, kind of a relatively small or medium size a Muslim population with less than 70,000, um, can you tell us maybe how you have reached out to them or how you might be representing their concerns when it comes to education, family values, religious freedom? And, you know, that kind of goes back to uh, being out in the community and listening to people because any, I've, I've been saying this, you know, for over a year that any politician that tells you that they know everything or they have the answers to everything, they're lying to your face because nobody can know everything. That's why you need, you know, like these big, robust teams. That's why the president has, you know, a cabinet of 50 plus people because you can't possibly know everything out there. So it, it really is comes down to actually going out and listening to people, talking to people, holding town halls like we have and, you know, getting to where people are uh, to, to hear what their issues are. Um, one of the biggest issues that I hear about uh, here in the state of Wisconsin and especially in my district is the school voucher program. Unfortunately, that's not really something uh, the federal government, it, you know, wants to necessarily act on. That's more of a state issue. So I always have to, you know, tell them like, hey, you know, like, I, I agree with you. This is a huge issue. and We do need to do something about it. But, you know, then you get into the whole state's rights issues and, you know, people don't want the federal government telling them what the states can do. So I always have to kick that down. That's why we always like to have a couple of the state uh, and local candidates with us because, you know, I'll basically give that same pitch about the school voucher program. Like, I'd love to help, but, you know, un until people want the federal government stepping into everything that states do, then, you know, this is really going to come down to, you know, Kevin Riley or Sam D'Amico or, you know, like all these other people running for office. So it it is just about listening to people, taking their concerns forward and bringing those concerns to your team so you can figure out, you know, what's the best way forward with this. Yeah. And kind of talking about states' rights, um, an issue that is on the ballot this November is women's reproductive rights, um, specifically regarding abortion. As you, we all know, um, Roe v. Wade was overturned two years ago and since has now been left up to the states individually, meaning, you know, women might be able to travel to seek those services. Um, so can you kind of just maybe give us a little insight as someone who is, you know, hoping to secure a federal position 
you know, how, how might you approach that? How might you approach these concerns of these women in your district? Yeah, so, you know, obviously women's rights is kind of the biggest issue um, in this election that we've heard from, you know, multiple people. It's a big reason why we wanted to get involved with this election is because uh, we know for a fact that my opponent, Scott Fitzgerald, will absolutely sign a national abortion ban day one if he can. So we need to get people like that out of office because when Roe v. Wade was overturned, the state of Wisconsin was uh, one of several states that had um, SNAP laws come into effect. And so uh, we rolled our reproductive laws all the way back to 1849, which was the year after Wisconsin became a state. So if we're going to be governing people with laws, you know, from the 1800s, I think we need, you know, a big change from that. We need to update our policies on that because, I mean, for for God's sake, surgeons weren't even washing their hands back in 1849. So if we're really going to roll women's reproductive rights all the way back to that, then shouldn't everybody else follow? So we shouldn't be allowed to scrub in and scrub out. I, I worked at the children's hospital in an OR, and I tell you, like, we take hand hygiene very, very seriously. So if we're, you know, going to roll women's rights all the way back to 1849, then, you know, what's stopping us from doing that? with everybody else you know should i be able to smoke while i'm doing a surgery you know are we going to roll back to the 1960s like what what are we doing here so uh you know it is a huge issue and you know it is all it's not just about abortion access you know it's about ivf contraception different things like that and i just can't believe that i'm having to fight this fight that my, you know, mother and grandmother fought for, you know, 50 plus years ago. And it just feels so weird. And I say it all the time when I'm like giving these speeches to women's groups and, uh, you know, like county parties and different things like that, that I feel so weird, you know, being the quote unquote face of the fifth district for reproductive freedom. Because like I said, my opponent will sign a national abortion ban day one if he could. So I'm, you know, kind of our only hope in this district to have somebody that will fight for reproductive freedoms. And it just feels weird being a, you know, 30 year old white guy saying, you know, I'm the face of women's reproductive freedoms. But you know, that's where we're at right now. And we need, you know, people that are going to fight and advocate for everybody, not just, you know, the white male constituency. So that's another, you know, big change that I have from Scott Fitzgerald, I will listen to other people, I will fight for other people, because that's what I've done for my whole career. Yeah, and that is a very interesting point that you um, see yourself that way, you know, as a man who is kind of forced to have an opinion about, um, you know, a very woman specific issue. Um, Can you kind of maybe just elaborate or give us a little bit about and how you usually go about that. Is there specific groups that you consult? Um, you know, how does it feel to to be a man who has to have this this stance, basically? Yeah, you know, like like I said, it, it's weird, but there's a whole lot of issues that, you know, I don't necessarily have a hand in that I still have strong views on, um, you know, so it really comes down to, you know, what I said before about anybody that tells you they know everything is lying to you. So that's why we talk to all these people and we, you know, like let people event with us and you know about issues that I've never even thought of before so it is just really about listening to other people and just having you know empathy for them obviously you know one of the one of the biggest issues right now facing federal uh, politicians is what's happening in Gaza And, you know, as somebody that was born in Wisconsin, you know, I have I have German Irish heritage. I, you know, have very little ties with the Middle East, but I still feel strongly that, you know, we need to stop what's happening over there. Because as somebody would, you know, anytime this question get asked, people are always like, how are you going to answer that? You know, what a tough question. And it really, really is. But, uh, you know, I always fall back on my experiences and my empathy. So somebody who works in emergency medicine, you know, I've been in the back of an ambulance, I've been in ERs, OR med flight like so i've seen the worst of the worst i've seen firsthand what gun violence does you know working in milwaukee like every single week you know we have gunshot victims come in um i've seen people you know devastated by house explosions and house fires and things like that and just the fact that anybody would you know cheer on the death and destruction of other people is something that i just like it it can't sit well with me You know, uh, I'm not a career politician. I'm not, uh, you know, like super well versed with overseas policies and things like that. But when it comes down to it, seeing women and children murdered, seeing, you know, hostages being taken from their families and held for hundreds and hundreds of days, like, you know, on both sides, we have issues, but the politicians 
on both sides won't come to the table and be true leaders, which is what we really need. And that's what I've been saying on the campaign trail the whole time is that we have enough politicians in Washington. It's time that we actually bring true leaders to Washington. that are going to have these tough conversations that are actually going to go to the table and make real change for the people uh, that they're supposed to be serving instead of just sitting there, you know, ramping up their political rhetoric and, you know, whipping their side into a frenzy. Like we need to come together and we need to work through these issues as human beings instead of my side versus your side. Yeah. And that leads me directly into my last question, which is related to Gaza, but specifically when it comes to Muslim voters, right? Historically, largely Muslim voters are democratic. Um, However, you know, this cycle, you know, whether they want to be single issue or not, um, some Muslim voters maybe are not completely comfortable voting Republican or Democrat because the current Democratic administration, the Biden administration, has, you know, aided Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, so maybe how can you address these concerns when it comes to the presidential election and how voters um, might feel about this issue? Yeah, and, you know, again, uh, these real easy questions you're tossing my way, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to answer. But it again, it comes down, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to the same point, but it comes, comes down to talking to people. And one thing that, uh, you know, I will criticize uh, the, the Biden administration for is that, you know, I don't know if they've necessarily heeded what the Muslim Americans have been saying to them. I mean, you look at the state of Michigan, how many, uh, you know, Michigan voters during that primary election voted um, uncommitted. I mean, that's that's a huge, it's tens of thousands of people voted for that. And that's, I mean, that's crazy. Um, you can get that many people, um, you know, to, to sway the election that way. And if we, you know, really carry that out to what would happen November 5th, if we did have that third party, if we had all those, you know, what you say generally democratic voters vote third party or just stay home, that's, you know, going to affect the presidential race. And that could, you know, sway towards Donald Trump. The other thing about that is that if they don't go out and vote, you know, then we have all of our state and local politicians that also aren't getting those votes uh, that they would be counting on. So we could be swinging it, you know, back into the extreme right. And one of the biggest things that I've been saying, um, you know, about this issue in Gaza and Israel is that we have both of the governments on those sides are, you know, kind of, I don't know if extremist governments are the words, but I mean, look at the actions that are happening right now that only happens like, you know, through extremism. And so I don't think that the, the people that are leading the civilians that are suffering are the best people to actually be leading those countries right now. And so I guess what I would say, you know, to uh, the people that feel left behind by uh, the Democratic Party is that's a lot of the people in my district too have felt, you know, abandoned by the Democratic Party. And that's why it's been so red for such a long time. But then we look at all of our rural communities that are suffering because of these policies enacted by Republicans that are taking, uh, you know, like local money out of those areas and putting them towards, you know, the, the top 1% or even, you know, the uh, military industrial complex. So we need to focus more on our uh, rural areas, on our local communities, so we can actually build those ties together and make it a, a better place for everybody instead of, you know, the people that are paying the politicians to vote the way they are. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Steinhoff. It was a delight having you. All right. Thank you guys so much.